Hello and welcome back and that's right today was Synology's 2021 launch and a number of you just like me were watching it and let's be honest the fact that there was a bad gateway timeout was something that a lot of us should really have expected. Year on year uh, the Synology launch event has always garnered quite a lot of participation from a lot of us from myself attending these events and looking at the new things they're showing off to people that access remotely to a lot of the live streams that have been done in previous years. The result is that this has probably been the most popular one so far and because of it they got bombarded so i mean even early doors if you look at their twitter you've got the majority of the information there but we were all hitting that page and hitting a big old white screen of nothing but we persevered and got there in the end there's a bunch of videos on their youtube channel right now as well as the official page that details a lot of what they've got in store for 2021 and today's video is a roundup it's not going to be a short one i was thinking about breaking this into multiple videos but ultimately it's going to be better just to get it all out there and for you guys to pick and choose from this what are the most important bits to you but a few disclaimers straight off the bat there's always going to be a disclaimer this does not cover all the information and i strongly strongly recommend that you check out the official videos there's five up there right now uh, key people at the Synology organization gave presentations on products and services um, in the lineup and they go into a lot more detail than this. This is a summary and should be treated as such. But either after you watch this or maybe even now if you're more of a technical mind, I do advise that you check that out. Also, it's worth highlighting, this was a digital event. Year on year, this has been largely an event in the past where we could go there and look at some hardware and watch presentations and lots of stuff that's going on with Synology's storage and services and stuff. But because this has been digital, there's a huge focus on software, utility, services, and most certainly this whole hybrid cloud system. The result is there's practically no hardware mentions here. For those of you that followed this and was hoping on getting more information on the hopefully soon to be released DS1821 um, Plus or newer rack mount Ryzen generation devices that may or may not be on the horizon, there is none of that. So if you've come to this video looking for hardware, I'd skip it to be honest. But apart from that, let's get on. Obviously, the lion's share of the coverage goes down to DSM-7. Disk Station Manager 7 originally unveiled to us as early as late 2018. We've still been waiting on a public beta, and I'm pleased to say a public beta has been displayed. It's happening, and depending on when you're watching this, it may already be active on the 8th of December 2020. Right now, that is in a mere few hours' time at the time of recording, and hopefully when this goes out to you guys. But given time zones... I'm not sure if they're going to commit to Taiwan time, Greenwich Mean Time, like they seemed to for this one, or uh, for the presentation, or other time zones. But hopefully, within the next 24 hours of you watching this video, you've either got access to the beta, or you very soon will. There has already been a private beta out there that a number of us have played with, but we couldn't talk about. But pretty much all of the features and services that we've talked about, or are going to talk about, are available in this public beta. Now... What are the key improvements? First and foremost, that UI. It's slicker, it's faster, it opens a great deal more promptly, and it has improvements on the GUI that you can notice straight away. They've gone for that, uh, keeping it simple regard, but there's a lot more graphical stuff there. They didn't even touch on the help and the guides that are built into the background of DSM, and they are really, really good. Um, and I'm looking forward to talking about those during the public beta. But first and foremost, there is the secure authentication in the pre previous version of DSM, you've always had this kind of username, password, that's kind of the go-to system for a number of us. But over the years, with us needing as many passwords as possible, and of course the idea that, oh no, you need two special characters, oh, and two capital letters, and a number, and a bat symbol, it just gets too involving. And they've included other features and add-ons like two-step verification and more in the past. But now um, there is going to be support of their own authenticator application. We kind of half talked about this before. But the Sec uh, Synology Secure Sign-In app is going to be available for iOS and Android. I'm sure there's going to be a client app out there, but it wasn't too clear on that one. Um, that is going to allow users to be able to uh, have an either another tier to the login process or to move away from traditional passwords and allow them to use that authenticator. It's not dissimilar to that of Google Authenticator, but it's far more Synology centric. There's also support of FIDO2, um, which again is more of a integrated uh, system that other 
uh, authenticating uh, authenticator apps utilize so that means it opens it up a little bit about if you're using a pre-existing authenticating system within your business and structure it allows that to be integrated into it now going straight into the ui there the next area that was really focused on was that of storage manager a whole overhaul overhaul of the entire ui we already talked about it last year both in the uk the taiwan and the german presentations they talked about how it's all in a single screen there with graphics demonstrating the storage pool and the volumes immediately on screen to you there. And the side tiers before where you had to fl uh, flick between caching and storage pools and volumes, that's all gone now and replaced by more of a kind of breadcrumb style of um, folder storage um, pool going into volume management on the left. It's incredibly clear with uh, the SSD caching integration far more based internally within that single frame that you're looking at there on screen. On top of that, there's improvements in RAID functionality, everything from RAID rebuilding to uh, RAID degradation performance, and of course, uh, drive replacements. Uh, we talked about before with uh, the drive failure prediction, there was less mention on the intelligence side of that that we saw a couple of years ago, and it seems to be something that Synology are holding back on, but not completely. There's this whole thing they're going with, a look at my notes there, of um, drive replacement in the background. And it's the idea of having, if you have an available bay, to have a drive that lives in there. And if you suspect that one of your drives may be suffering from some kind of um, issue, you can clone those two drives together without having to wait for a RAID rebuild or to remove a drive from the array. This will significantly reduce downtime and certainly reduce when you uh, realize that your system's gonna have to do a repair and then you're going to lose a bunch of performance there in the background or have to remove the whole system from connection. Now, on that, it's worth highlighting that they have got reported improvements in this newer version of DSM, improvements of RAID 6 performance of up to 80% reported speed improvements. Now, obviously, that is relative. There's loads of factors that are going to go into um, a statement like that, but it's worth highlighting RAID 6 is, of course, probably the most demanding RAID configuration out there with a two-disc parity level to calculate. But a really interesting bit was when it talked about uh, rate degradation in rate six, uh, improvements of up to 70% faster there as well. And rate degradation, when you've got a large rate array and a drive dies and you replace it either with an intelligently managed hot swap, which is something that's also being rolled in here, or if you're just manually injecting a new drive with uh, traditional um, hot swapping um, of the bays, then RAID degradation is something that will go on for, depending on the RAID configuration, a RAID 5 or a good SHR, will go on for 12, 24 hours or longer. So knowing you've got decent performance, even in a uh, state of degradation, is very important indeed. And a nice welcome change to that. I'm looking forward to reviewing and bench testing uh, when we've got the DSM-7 public beta here for you guys here on the channel. Now, SSD caching is something that, of course, in 2020, they have been hitting at so hard with their own SSDs, of course, being factored in a big, big way in the release of their new 2020 and 21 series, having M2 NVMe bays inside. But DSM-7 is gonna have a greater degree of control of how you um, you know configure these SSDs live, and if you remove them and replace them, a number of you that may have bought the DSM nine uh, DS nine one eight now over three years ago may have bought that with M two NVMe's inside. Now, if you've been hammering that cache nonstop, they might be due a replacement because SSDs and the NAND do wear away. But for those of you that have ever upgraded or removed um, SSDs in a cache environment, you'll know that it takes the whole uh, storage volume and storage pool out of operation. It just pff, can't use it. And then you have to wait until whatever SSD caching operation that you are performing, that maintenance is done before you can remount it. And if you've got loads of shares and your company is based around that, that's not great. So it's nice to know that in DSM-7, you can remove and play around with the SSDs in that caching without it needing the main storage uh, pools and volumes there to be disconnected. A big, big change there. There's a lot of work that's gone into that in the background that's just not present in a simple on-off click. So I think a little bit of credit is due for them on that one. Now, when it comes to a lot of that stuff to do with how you interact with the NAS, one thing that a lot of people have inquired about over the number of years, and it's something that has grown in popularity due to the stability of the storage and the performance thresholds that people uh, expect to be standard uh, and the maintenance of them, 
there is now going to be support of Fiber Channel FC support on um, a lot of the Synology hardware and there's lots of cards out there. There's no real commitment on the HBA cards that are going to be supported in this, but those of you that already currently use the iSCSI Manager application, um, that's being uh, uh, improved and the name changed to SAN Manager, Storage Area Network Manager. And for those of you that have moved away from mapped network shares and moved away from rather, you know, um, low level file access into the NAS to something a bit more localized in appearance, you'll know that SAN technology for that high volume and archival storage is very, very desirable. And it's good to see that DSM-7 is going to integrate a great deal of this with that SAN manager. Next, we can talk about hybrid share. This is something that's been more evolved than the first time we heard about it last year. And hybrid share is this ability to connect your Synology C2 public cloud with your NAS system on a business level and with a huge amount of control and configuration as well as analytical access with a combination of these three tools. That is hybrid share working together with C2 directories, which is a far broader and intelligent um, control system of that um, a C2 cloud storage. And that combined with Active Insight working as a huge overview of your Synology hardware environment being deployed in all those different locations is brings together this enormous idea of hybrid storage. We've talked about hybrid cloud storage on the platform before. The idea that you don't have just a NAS or the cloud, you have both of them and have them working together, not just as a means of backup, but as a means of making sure that your data is where it needs to be and conversely, that the data that doesn't need to be there won't be synchronized there. It's intelligent and it's a better control of your bandwidth. Now, let's go through what we learned during it. With the hybrid cloud system, you've got intelligent data on demand. And that is to say that different locations will have the data it needs. And as they access it, that same sort of file panel we talked about before, but on a more analytical level, it's not automated as you saw um, in Synology Drive coverage earlier uh, this year. On top of that, with the C2 directory, they've got a uh, C2 directory even, you've got this thing called organizational units. And organizational units allows the administrator, the overseer, to be able to group things together in these tiny blocks and therefore be able to micromanage and make decisions thanks to Active Insight, um, all of those different areas of hybrid sharing between localized physical bare, you know, metal storage and the cloud in the background. Now that admin control is quite sophisticated and it allows the um, overseer, the admin, to be able to bespo uh, bestow the right control to the connected users at each location as well. And again, it utilizes Active Insight, that enormous overview tool that we talked about before that there will be a follow-up video on to provide that information it gives a better privilege control as well as a lot more um customizable alerts and kind of targeted if this then that style um architecture to the design now the, from it from active insight you can of course monitor the health you can of course monitor system configurations firmware and more so again you have a single overseer point of control and a greater and more evolved way to bestow control in those grouped ways with organizational units, but also giving you the ability to just go, right, you guys have got that and nothing more. And then, you know, that control can be leveraged accordingly. So it's nice to see that the benefits of the cloud and it's, you know, if you're working through the cloud to the NAS, or working with them both together. So if one drops, you've still got the other option. And of course, this idea of the intelligent caching in the background of data for when your network drops, all of this is rolled together in the benefits of hybrid share storage. And it's something we're gonna see a lot more in the background of DSM-7. They've really taken caching seriously this year. And it's something that I think we're seeing um, uh, playing out very, very well in this NAS to cloud uh, relationship here in the background. Next up, we can talk about the improvements to the ever popular Synology Active Backup Suite. That tool that allows you to pretty much manage an entire um, client uh, backup um, relationship you've got across your whole um, operation environment, be it home or business. If you've got multiple PCs knocking around, if you run a VM environment with VMware, Hyper-V, that sort of thing, or you are running 
just a different system of devices, be they mobile, be they desktop and more. Active Backup Suite, which is included in the cost of the Synology, allows you to have this enormous overview of all of those backups and you can check, make sure things are backed up accordingly and even port over to virtual instances um, if you need to, uh, if they are available. Now, it has run for a long time. It's still very popular. It's always covered uh, to a lesser or greater degree a number of VMs, physical, and there's been inclusions of cloud um, services as well. So your Office 365 and um, G Suite as well, all of that user account and emails and stuff like that. So it is backed up in a native fashion, which is incredibly useful. And also when you want to migrate or duplicate that data as well, Active Backup Suite currently has the inclusion of that with specific add-ons as well for those cloud services mentioned. But where they're going with it in further 2021 is um, support of Linux servers, as they rightly point out, a number of people use very customized Linux servers where you are going to need a very specific um, a client or agent tool there at the other end, and they are bringing support of that. And of course, the big one that we talked about last year, Mac support. So many Mac users um, have complained about the ability, their lack of support compared with that of Windows um, in Active Backup Suite. And a lot of that isn't Synology's fault. Windows was very forthcoming with the tools when it came to integrating a number of their services early doors. And it hasn't exactly left Mac to catch up, but it has meant that Mac development on this tool has clearly taken longer and it does, you know, it is coming in 2021. So obviously that comes down to having the right client, uh, the tool to be on your Mac system and having those backups um, time managed and all the differential backups and stuff running with Active Backup Suite there in the background. But it's worth highlighting that I still am not 100% convinced that a lot of the Active Backup Suite advantages, such as that of being able to deploy a backup of, say, a Linux server as a VM, are going to be possible in that Mac environment. I just can't see it happening. Mac has been incredibly um, immovable on the subject of VMs of their architecture, and I can't see that playing out there. But we shall see. You can certainly do it with instances of virtual DSM and uh, a lot of those VMwares as well to make them VM deployable in the event of a disaster. Now, yeah, talking of backup, it's worth highlighting that the configuration of a number of applications, if you are someone that deploys NASes a lot, or you are in a constantly evolving hardware environment, or if you're like me and you box NASes for videos and tutorials and your very livelihood all the time, you'll know that it is really dull repeating a lot of the configuration options, the setup and more. Uh, they are saying that up to now 38 packages are going to support um, backup of configurations to Synology, um, your Synology account as well. So again, that's a nicer degree of control and streamlining there in the background. And of course, there is going to be the compression technique that we talked about before. Um, this is something that's a little bit related to something we talked about earlier there. Um, Synology is saying that although deduplication is factored into the likes of a number of their backup tools, again, that includes Hyper Backup and, of course, Active Backup Suite in places, they are hoping for, and I say hoping for, they're promising uh, deduplication to be more widely available across their um, entire Synology backend system, not just app-based, but across the whole system as a whole. On top of that, there's also going to be that compression technique as well that's there saying supports up to a 40% saving when utilised. But again, let's see that in practice, shall we? Finally, let's move away from the busy, busy business side of things and go to something a little bit more middle ground for a number of us, of course, Synology Photos, an application we already talked about. Um, again, last year when it was first announced, it was the, effectively a single uh, tool to replace PhotoStation and Synology Moment to bring the advantages of both into a single application. And in a way, it makes a lot of sense, I've got to say, even when we've done early access to the program, it has seemed um, like it has all of the benefit for, benefits of PhotoStation, such as all of the information there in the background of the metadata, like the camera that took the picture, the aperture, the lighting, you know, the lens, all that kind of stuff is now available, something that's just not available in Synology moments there in the background. There's also better um, album and folder level um, access in Synology Photos, they're saying at least and in earlier testing that we've done, but it's worth highlighting that although we did talk about this a year ago and they did talk a big game about um, folder control, there doesn't seem to be any mention of standard 
back-end root breadcrumb folder access on Synology Photo, something that's not in PhotoStation, that isn't in Moments, and I get the impression that it is not going to be in Synology Photos either. Now, if you do have an existing um, photo collection and database and thumbnails and stuff within PhotoStation and or Moments, once you upgrade to DSM-7, they're saying it's all gonna be integrated into DSM-7 and Photo Station um, and Synology Photos. You will have that information carried over, so you won't have to do the rebuilding, you won't have to go through the whole thing again. It will kind of migrate what you've already got from those two applications and make them readily available. Also, it's worth highlighting if you do interact with the NAS using Synology Photos and your mobile phone, and a number of you that heard the recent news about um, Google Photos now stopping its free photo backups. A number of you are like, oh my God, what am I going to do? Um, it's worth highlighting that thumbnail generation has always been kind of the Achilles heel for a number of users when it comes to interacting with their photos on a NAS. You can control thumbnail generation on your client device and it can be all held there. Something that a number of you will probably see the benefit of, but even then, that's really a flexible option that I've never really took advantage of. I've not really had the thumbnail generation problem that a number of have, but it'll be interesting to hear if that's happened to you. Um, carrying on through my notes there, it's worth mentioning the GUI of Synology Photos we have talked about before, but let's touch on that a little bit. It's comparable more to Synology Moments than it is to PhotoStation. It just has a lot more of the elements of control, and they've got a few extra tab options at the top that let you flick between albums and not just those... Um, kind of uh, intelligently created ones from the AI photo recognition and that of checking the geo uh, and metadata information on those photos for like locational stuff. And of course you can use the search functionality built into Synology Photos to not only check the metadata and find out more information about um, the devices that took the photo and search that way, but also of course you can use the information that's garnered from the AI deep learning for you know, stuff like thing recognition and facial recognition where you tag people in the background. Um, it's also worth highlighting that not only is there that business of uh, the metadata checking there in the background, but when it does scrape all that information, once again, from your existing photo station or moments um, application data, it does seem like that's all gonna get carried over too, so you're not gonna have to repeat it all. Now, for those of you that are worried that Synology Photos is gonna lose a lot of the business kind of professional photographer options that PhotoStation has um, if they do move over to Synology Photos. I wouldn't worry. It seems like they're saying that that degree of control and the configurations that are currently present in PhotoStation are going to be available in Synology Photos. And there's this whole thing they call shared space, which allows you to create a nice shared area of those albums for your clients. If you do like a wedding shoot for someone and you want to be able to share it in a safe, secure, kind of a, a, a sellable fashion, these are all going to be fo um, folded into Synology Photos as well. And they are going to be available from the version in the beta, once again, from the 8th. And that's really it. It's all been about software here at the Synology 2021 launch. Um, now... Again, hopefully, they're going to talk some hardware soon. I'm hoping to talk to you guys about some new hardware very soon. Who knows? But do stay tuned for the Synology DSM-7 beta starting, if not tomorrow, then probably for some of you, right now. Do check it out. Hopefully, I'll put a link in the description. And, of course, there's a link to the NASCAMPER article. We'll be going into a lot more detail about this. And, of course, I've already highlighted this. Do go check out the Synology videos because they're going into a lot more detail, a lot more analytical information than I've talked about today. Give them a look. But otherwise, thank you so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this roundup. I've chucked a lot of information at you. Thanks for listening. Do click like if you've enjoyed the video. Subscribe to learn more. And I will see you next time.